Mute your mic, mute your mic.
All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Evening, sir. All right, so there's a few things. So one, you know that your mid-semester is next week, Wednesday. Your mid-semester is next week, Wednesday. I'm very so scared. No, there's no need to be scared. It's very similar to what you did for the, it's gonna be 20 multiple choice questions. Um, it's, it's the same thing, that, uh, very similar to what you did for the first quiz. It takes okay. the same format, multiple choice questions. It's just that the multiple choice questions will be up to, I think we are up to module four now. Let me just double check. To ensure that it's the right module. So the questions will be, um, let me just check to see if it's, which module we're at. We're at segmentation, targeting and positioning. I'm just closing some of these things that I have open because I had a class before. So I have a lot of files open. Let me just go there. Principles of marketing, uh, just to ensure not that, right. So unit, right, so up to unit four. So, so four, five, 20. So you're gonna get five questions per unit. All right, five questions per unit, 20 questions, five questions per unit, and you will get your results as you complete your mid-semester exam. All right? Okay, sir. All right, so it's not, as I said, the pop quiz, the quiz that you did is the same thing, same um, format. What I recommend you do is not just to listen to the recordings, but you can actually go and find questions multiple choice questions on the internet on each unit that we have done and try to answer them, all right? So when is the mid-semester The mid-semester is next week, Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, so I usually ensure that we do it in the, not five o'clock, but always seven o'clock because I know some persons are working and some persons, it takes them some time to reach home and things like that. All right, so that's one. The other thing, I was supposed to upload the coursework to Moodle, but I, I chaired a meeting today for three, three and a half hours. Then after that, my a good friend of mine, former colleague, wanted a recommendation from me. So I ended up leaving home to go and put it on a letterhead for him. And I came back a little bit late, then I had a five o'clock class. So I will put it there, but I'm just gonna share it screen again. This is the... This is the same assignment as I said to you guys. We are the ones that write the assignment. Um, so it's the same assignment, working in groups of four to six, and you're really just doing what is called an industry analysis. After the mid-semester, the following week, um, at least beginning on Monday, at least for about 10 to 20 minutes of the class, we are going to start to have a conversation about the project, your group project. So one, um, you know, who are your group members, which industry are you thinking about, and you start, who's doing what, so it's four to, four to six persons, you kind of, you know, one person might be doing one, two, three, another might be doing four, five, six, and so you dissect the responsibilities, and we have a conversation, and you show me what you have been, what you are doing over time, so by the time you get to the final project, it's actually a very, you get a very good um, grade, because the project has been properly done. All right, is there anybody or is there a group already? Anybody has an idea or who their group members are? There must be a group leader and the industry that they want to investigate. You don't have to mention it no publicly because I don't want people to start, you know, to quote unquote, steal your ideas. But if you have that, you can inbox me or um, send me a message on, on WhatsApp or, can, or you can just say, sir, we have a group. I have my group and we're thinking about this. Any person um, wants to speak at this time in relation to the group assignment? Um, I have a group already and we have already um, given out our responsibility of who to do what already. 
All right, so I think so this I'll is... I'll give back to you the information and who right. are the group members. Right, so that would be... Um, thanks for that, Camila. And you, you can send it to me via the chat. You know that you can send a direct message to me and no one else can see that. All okay. right. Yes, thanks for that, Miss Green. Anybody else? And, the, and I, I'm not saying that you have to have that no, but I'm just asking because I want to ensure that the area that you're looking at, first of all, the product that you're looking at as well as the company in relation to its competitors and in the marketplace, that there's ample information about it. And as I said, the brand can be local and it can be regional, but it cannot be international. In other words, it can't be outside of the Caribbean because then of course it becomes irrelevant to your own training and development and certification as graduates of Jamaica and the Caribbean. All right, so I will ensure to upload this. It's the same document. Um, it's just that it gives you additional um, information in relation to the marks. There are two ways of how we can do this. Um, they give us the option of you presenting and also handing in the final paper or just handing in the final paper. So we could do, so I made sure that it is due the last day of the class, which is the Wednesday. So you could do the presentation on the Monday. I give you feedback. And of course, you incorporate the feedback into your final paper. I'm giving you the option. Do you want to do it that way or you just want to give me a final paper? Sir, that way. All right, so you do the presentation on the Monday and then the final paper on the Wednesday. Yes, sir. All right, so the Wednesday would be the 23rd, 25, 24, 23. Yes, so it would be it would be Monday the twentieth, August twenty three, and then the final paper. And of course, you know you're not going to give me the you're going to upload the final paper to turn it in. All right. I realize too that a number of persons. And let me just go to turn it in. That a number of persons after the class also be, um, joined um, the, the class on turn it in. So let me just go to that and. I have my student list and let me share screen so you can see the persons who are there. All right, so I have Tiandra, Frankson, Camilla, Dion Hansen Gray. Please put your use capital letters where they are needed. Tiffany, Juanita, Fabian, Norda, Llewellyn, Estriano, Alicia, Anake, Francine, and Latoya Williamson, who also needs to put uppercase at the beginning of each word in her name. Is there anyone who's not a part of this? Um, I'm not understanding. Uppercase in student name or email address. Your, you use a capital letter for your name in all cases. Anywhere you're writing your name, it must begin with a capital letter. Your first Sir, name my and name your last name. Capital letter, both my first and last. So, and, I, and, I was speak, and I was speaking to the persons who didn't do that. Tiandra, for example, Dan, for example, and Latoya, for example. I wasn't referring to all students, I was referring to specific students. If you can see my screen, you can see that some of the names begin with common letter. And I know that it's not intentional. Persons who are just quickly writing, trying to get this thing out of the way. So I'm just telling them now to go back and um, make that correction. All right? So it's no big deal. Understood, sir. Yes. Um, is there anybody who is here now who's not on this list? I'm not on the list there. Uh, to whom am I speaking? Priscilla. I wasn't at class last week. Did you watch the recording? Not last week, la on Monday. No, no. All right, so you're going to watch it. Well, I can share the link with you now, or one of your classmates can guide you in terms of how to join. It's not very difficult. All right? Okay. I'm seeing, yes, I'm seeing something in the chat. All right. And they are, all right, Miss Green, I, I got that. All right, and just remember about the group assignment. People try not to wait, at least as of Monday, you have to start reporting. So we're gonna take some time out. I'm gonna put it in the breakout room in your respective groups. And I'm gonna come in and talk to the groups and you're going to advise me in terms of the product that you're looking at and the company and you know group members and who is doing what, who's the group leader. We have a, about a 10, 15 for each group. And then we go into the lecture. So I'm so guiding, sir, yes? Sorry. Um. We cannot create a product on our own, or it has to be somebody else's own. Um, did you did you see the assignment the assignment that I that I shared? There's no, no. product creation. No, have no. You, have you been coming to lectures? How many classes have you come to? It is Monday. 
Amistown. Oh, okay. And we spoke about it in detail. So I'm going to add it to um, Moodle. I was supposed to, but I sent it via email. Were you not copied in the email? Did you not get the email? No, I didn't send the email. All right. So I, I'm going to put it on Moodle nonetheless so that you can see it. All right. Um, I know in the past that some persons, for example, I talked to one of my colleagues who taught the course and she said that they, she gave them, she, show, she shared the assignment with me. And I said to her that one, she and I, she and I agree on, the, on this assignment. She actually liked this assignment, um, fully endorsed it. But I told her that I don't believe that first year students should be creating products, not for a marketing course. That's when you have gone through the, the, the rigors of the foundational and then they ask you to create a product, which is actually a course in and of itself. Called, um, it's called product development. A course in product development, we have to take it from inception, you have to brand it, you have to package it, you have to do a whole range of things, you have to come up with a brand statement, a whole range of things they have to do for the product. Because I actually did a course where we created, um, we created a, it was called Energy Moss. We had to create the, the, the box and all the things and the logo and this, well, holy, it was a killer course for me. And we did that course when I was closer to finishing my program, not at the beginning. At the beginning, at the beginning you do the foundational stuff where you try to understand how people make marketing decisions. And this is why you get what I call an industrial, uh, an industrial analysis. You're trying to see how companies that exist already make decisions about their marketing how they position themselves in the marketplace, where they do their marketing, who are their competitors, how they try to out, um, outbid their competitors, how they engage their customers and all of that. And, and also to, you'll be, you're being guided as you go along. So it's not as if I've given you the assignment and you're left on your own, all right? And it's a very, very good learning process because it's gonna force you know, to engage with the material, especially, especially when it comes on to segmentation, brand positioning and things like that. And it will also help you to become more critical when you see an ad on TV. To see, you're trying to figure out what is the, um, what is called the value proposition, you know, what are the benefits to the customer? Who exactly are they targeting? Why are they targeting that particular group? Is television the best medium? And not only television, the time that they choose to, 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 to show the advertisement or to play the advertisement, is that the best time because of the demographic that watches that particular program? All kinds of stuff. All right. And I'm hoping that when you guys reach to the bachelor's level, you, you, you actually choose marketing as your concentration. All right, any questions or any other concerns or anything? I know I spoke to mid-semester being next week, Wednesday. In other words, next week, this time is your mid-semester. And I spoke to the coursework assignment. Ms. Green? Mr. Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when we just started, you were saying that we probably would have to create an advertisement as a, uh, as a course piece, as a part of our grading. Um, I decided against that because I would have to teach you the rigors of advertising. So I'd have to teach you the techniques and there are over 22 techniques. I'd have to teach a lot of things. I have to teach you the purposes of advertisement. Then I'd have to teach you the elements of an ad. It's a whole range of stuff. So I decided against that. When you're going to do, when you go into fourth year, you're going to do a course, which I also teach called digital marketing. And that is one of the things that you will be asked to do. So I decided against that. So what we're going to do instead, the piece that you have given us? Yes, which is an industrial um, an industry analysis. Okay. Because okay. I was really, to be honest, looking forward to doing it now. <laughs> I know. Just, just, just ensure in, in fourth year you, cho you, you choose marketing <laughs> and do digital marketing. And by that time, too, we'd have revised the course because um, I am, I've been asked to look back at that course to see. We'll probably break it in two. And right now, I actually, a company reached out to me via um, one of my colleagues, and they want a, a social media coordinator. We actually don't teach social media as a part of a program at the institution. So I said to the head of school that this is an opportunity for us to teach um, not just social media, but digital marketing generally. Um, I'm one of the, the digital marketers, as well as the marketing officer who I supervise, um, Ricardo Panton. He's another person. So right now, if, if I had anybody who could do social media marketing, I could help them to get that job because the person reached out directly to me because they have seen what we have been doing on social media and our campaigns and stuff like that. And they, I guess they like what they're seeing. Um, and the ministry has endorsed us in terms of how we are positioning ourselves in terms of the K-13 programs and all of that. And as I said to you guys, most of the times the problem for our customers who are you is when you actually have to 
interact with the students, that's where you start getting a lot of customer complaints. Not the students, I mean the lecturers and with other administrators. You get a lot of customer complaints, not at the beginning, but more when you start interacting with lecturers and administrators. And I'm not saying that my colleagues are not well-intentioned, but sometimes we I try to listen to, 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 to students. I know students say that I'm miserable sometimes, but I, I really, really, really do listen okay. to my students um, to ensure that I also am conscious of the fact that I'm teaching adults. And like myself, they are human beings and we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. And everybody sometimes has a good day and a bad day. And I try to have not a good day and a bad day, but a professional day. All right, so so I'm I, I'm a student myself in in the sense of learning from my customers who are you, my students. You're working on yourself, sir, and that oh. is good. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks for that, Miss Tucker. I'm working on myself. I'm a project. All right, so today, sir? yes. Um, I want to know how long is uh, mid semester for next week? It's we usually do one hour or one and a half hour. I usually don't teach what I will do at the beginning of the class, like the first half hour is just for the group project. And then you it's do a, the ex and then you do the exam after. So it's a multiple okay, choice. Thanks. Time? Yes, it is fully multiple choice, 20 questions. Okay. Yes. So no essay. No essay. I will have a class where I will teach you how to write your essay. All right, and we are going to have, we're going to lose two hours. I'm going to try and find a creative way to get back the two hours because you know the, the, um, the semester is very short. It's exactly 10 weeks and there are exactly 10 units. And I'm, I have to find creative ways of ensuring that you're not necessarily short change in terms of coverage of the content. All right, and I did also mention to you guys that, the, that on Moodle, there are several um, resource materials that you can consult for um for if you want to um you know additional help or additional information or whatever so you can use the wednesday as it really is to get in the extra two weeks given the fact that it's our last class for the day oh yes 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 we could do that for for real yes all right thanks for that um recommendation miss maitland all right so we can we go into the lecture now we continue we were looking at segmentation targeting and positioning let me just bring up my, my lecture. Um, I, I, I had started last week. This is week four. Yes. I started last week. And I'll, I, I, if I get a chance, I'll also sh give you some statistical information about the segmentation in the marketplace in Jamaica, as well as um, listenership, stuff like that. So I, I, I know I, we had talked about, and as I said, segmentation, targeting, and, and positioning, STP. Uh, we talked about the objectives, and I want to kind of move on because we spoke about that. We had discussed what is segmentation, and we talked about grouping buyers based on needs, traits, and or behaviors. And we, this, these are the basis for segmentation, psychographics, geographics, demographics, behavioral. And we spoke about, for example, global brands in terms of targeting regions and how they now have to be very conscious of the cultural configuration or the traits of the, of the particular country, but not only different regions in the world, but even um, regions in a country or regions of a certain, let's call it an economic block, like for example, the, for example, countries that make up CARICOM or countries that make up the European Union and things like that. And also to that, even inside of a country, there are times where you have to target neighborhoods, cities, or even parishes. Um, the segment, the four geographic um, segments that we target are Kingston, St. Andrew, St. Thomas, and St. Catherine. And let me add parts of Portland, not the entire Portland because we have a location in St. Thomas. All right, and there are times when, I don't know if you know this, that you can actually target specific workplaces or buildings or institutions on social media. So I can target, um, let's say Tivoli High School, Kingston um, College, I can target um, UCC, I can target University of the West Indies. And these are things that I actually do when I'm doing digital marketing and it's not unethical. We spoke about the demographic um, segmentation and that this is very important, especially in understanding people's lifestyle and how their lifestyle, they kind of try to, the, the kinds of lifestyle that they live will um, affect their purchasing behavior. We spoke about psychographic, um, no, this is demographic, right? Sorry, my apologies, not demographic, not, I made an error. So demographic is really about looking at um, like, um, 
number of person, race, religion, ethnicity, household income, income per capita, age group, things like that. And psychographic you note, know, I was speaking to, especially in relation to lifestyle, and that many brands go after lifestyle segments because they know that people like to be associated with certain brands, um, just whether it be for status or just their personality or things like that. And we spoke about behavioral and we made mention of the, of use the example of Nike targeting African-American and aligning themselves to certain movements, especially since they know that a lot of African-Americans buy um, Nike for sports reasons and, and just for the fact that it has aligned itself to the Black movement. We spoke too about um, multiple segmentation and that especially in countries that are multicultural, or have uh, what I call justice movements, they have to have multiple segmentation where they're going after different groups, not just uh, um, based on age, but sometimes based on political um, affiliation and even sexual orientation. I know that this is something that is a little bit more sensitive on our side in Jamaica. And even in Jamaica, you do have hotels that target members of the LGBT community at the international level. They won't say this publicly, but they do. Um, segmented for this what what we do to even at excel and i can use excel as an example you have what is called the persona you actually try to come up with the persona of the of the of the segment or what the persona is really the typical the typical con the typical customer so one of our customer one of the one of our personas would be um uh, a 16 to, to a 16 to 8 year old 18 year old who's in high school who is a high school living um, graduate and is thinking about either pursuing cape and or an associate degree or a bachelor's degree that's one of our segments that's one of our personas another persona is michelle and michelle is between the age um, of probably uh let's say mid-20s into her 30s and she is working probably at a government institution and she has been working in the area but does not have the, the, the necessary qualifications for um promotion so we go after that segment that's a different segment then we have another person who is who has a first degree um, but just needs to do a short course so this is bob bob is a professional he is in his early 30s early 30s into mid mid 30s and he does not want to do a full program but he wants to you know just to get professional upgrading so that he's better able to carry out his function and, and and be more productive at work and is interested in a short course and this is how you kind of you, you need to know if you're at a company to know who exactly makes up the, the, the profile of the segments that you're going after i hope i'm making sense this is literally what we have to do as marketers so you have been segmented so take a moment and observe oh yes we're talking about this and we're not going to get to do is because in the interest of time so segmenting business markets and um, businesses usually uh, businesses use additional basis of segmentation operating characteristics purchasing purchasing approaches situational factors and personal characteristics and this really speaks to for example um especially in relation to business to business communication this is the business um b2b marketing where you you tar you segment it based on the how a particular business operates so let us say that you sell chips, let's say microchips to companies that make computer. There's a way of how you segment them, not necessarily on psychographics or, or demographics or geographics, but based on how they operate as a business. All right, so this is just a different type of segmentation. Um, segmenting international markets, usually when you're segmenting international markets, and here again, this is where the steep analysis comes into play because you have to understand the various factors at the international level um, in order to do segmentation. And let's just quickly look at the steep analysis. I gave an example, and this will, again will help you in terms of your assignment. Let me just go to it quickly look a little bit at the SIP analysis. All the SIP analysis really are the test analysis is just looking at the international factors and how they impact um, on the marketing environment. That's really what it is. Uh, where did I save it? It would be in general. Um, yeah, it would be general. It's the long one. Let me see if this is it. This is not it. So let me just give you a, a quick overview of that 
Uh, okay, yeah, and I'm using an example that I'd shared earlier, but I'm going specifically to the section that speaks to the steep analysis. All right, let me just increase the size so that you can see. All right, right. So when it comes on to the steep analysis or the pest analysis, they use these different terms. So it says current trends and marketplace implications for this is the industry, the tea industry in this case, right? So the technology, you're what you're doing or what you're trying to do is to see how technology you know, affects the marketing of a particular category of good, which is a tea, or how it affects the tea industry. So one within the context of the pandemic, you no, know, you know that. Um, most webs, most brick and brick and mortar stores, for example, have to know go fully on um, e-commerce. They have to rely heavily on digital marketing. So online, um, the technology in terms of online, no, for example, the customers. Where do you find your customers? So it's going to affect in terms of your communication channels, the platforms that you use to communicate your, with your customers. So let's look at this example. It says increase in online purchases or slash e-commerce. In other words, more people are making purchases online than going into a physical store. So as a marketer, you have to think about that. All right, and this says, this may pose a negative for David Stee that relies heavily on its proprietary locations across North America. In other words, they rely heavily on brick and mortar. All right, social, let us say technology, social media platforms have become an integral part of the target of, of millennials, if you're targeting millennials as your segment in the marketplace. In terms of re, um, regulator or political, you have to look at, for example, laws relating to um, consumer consumption or con, um, pricing, um, for example, packaging. So there are certain acts in Jamaica that will have implications for a marketer and or for a company. Let me just see if I can quickly um, find some of these laws. So let's say laws that affect marketing. In. Let me see what they come up with. So we have, for example, a regulatory um, body. Um, we have the Consumer Protection Act in Jamaica. That would be one that affects, affects um, marketers. We have the Fair Competition Act. We have the Advertisements Regulation Act. So there are several legislation that would affect a marketer because you want to ensure that whatever you're doing is not illegal. And I'm speaking to the right people, right? Because you guys, most of you work in either the JCF or the JDF. So you'll understand the, the need for the legislation or the regulation. So that's what that is speaking to. And I'm going back to sharing screen in terms of the pistol or the SIP analysis. The economics now, all economics is speaking to is the income per capita, income per household, um, probably the level of, well, the level of poverty and so forth. But of course, in relation to the segment that you're going after, do they have the spending power? And it depends, as I said, it depends on the brand that you're looking at. So economists is talking about dollars and cents. That's really what it is. And whether or not the segment that you're going after actually have the, the economic power. So the profile of your segment or each segment is critical. So who are you going after? You normally give the person, for the segment, you normally give the person, create a person or a persona, give them a name. So if it's a male, it might be John. If it's a female, it might be Michelle. All right, environmental slash ecological, and you can avoid the word ecological. It's just, it's just a fancy term to say that whether or not the brand itself has taken into consideration health concerns, concerns relating to the environment and things like that. Whether or not they're using processed ingredients and GMOs, genetically modified food, we're talking about processed food and things like that. Is it, for example, let us say that it is Lasco. When you look at the labeling, um, when you look at, for example, the, the label, Alaska mackerel or whatever, what are you seeing on the actual label? All right, and these things must also be readily available, readily available on, on, on a company's website. Demographics, no, demographics, and we just spoke about demographics in terms of age, ethnicity, race, and all of that, uh, and so forth. Sociocultural, in our case, I don't know that it's sociocultural for us because Jamaica tends to have a kind of Jamaican culture. We don't really have a different kind of culture. We tend to have a very Jamaican culture. And you find that probably in the culture for us, what you find now is that marketers or advertisers or brands or trademarks now, um, they are really 
using Jamaican Creole in their ads. They're also using what I call cultural figures in their ads. They're using popcorn, they're using Beanie Man, they're using these various different artists as a way to reach people in the marketplace. They're also now using influencers, people who pop up. I'm sure you have seen many comedians on social media. Actually, my nephew who lives in Midtown Tivoli, he's a part of the whole um, online comedy bus kind of creating content not he's not really in front of the camera I tell him not in front of the camera for the don't embarrass the family in front of the camera we don't want to be on camera but he's Wait, kind he's of the brain blogger? he's one of you no know, he's one of the he's one of the producers of 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 what's that guy's name again uh as soon tell you the the, the 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 comedian and they create content in denim tone um in midtown tivoli it's a lot of content and what happens is that the 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 star of the show usually know is approached by different brands because they see them as influencers so you sometimes you see them um promoting or endorsing a, a, a certain type of chicken or whatever it is i'm sure you have seen that and that you know is part probably what you can speak about in relation to the cultural all right making sense people Making sense? Yes, sir. Uh, OK, all right. All right, so let me just go back to the lecture. Uh, right, so we spoke about um, the political. So this is what I was really explaining in terms of, especially in, in terms of international markets. There are, that there are several things that you have to be um, very conscious about when you're operating in different parts of the world. And I'm, I'm not sure how many persons are familiar with H&M as a brand. I love H&M. When I'm in Canada, I go to H&M a, a lot, especially to the sales section. But of course, they're, no, they, they're also all over the world as functioning as a, as a kind of multinational corporation. And they have to be, be very conscious of the cultural configurations of Japan. It's a different kind of country. And intermarket segmentation, and this is actually very good. And this is what um, MNCs like KFC, Burger King, Popeyes, they do. It says segmenting cost consumers who have similar needs and buying behavior, even though they are located in different countries. People love fast food. Wherever people are in the world, they love fast food. Because one, people are very busy and on the go. They can't bother with the work. But also, too, you have another company that say, OK, people love fast food, but there are also people globally who love, who are very health conscious. So I, I will go after them in terms of um, in terms of healthy food things. You have persons who love to exercise. People love to be love to exercise all over the world. I'm going to go after them in terms of promoting uh, which which brand is associated with it running, like with tracks and all that, which um, footwear would you say is that is is a global brand when it comes Puma. down to athletics? Puma, so, Nike, so Puma, Nike. Um, if you notice too, uh, what they call Red Bull. Red Bull is a kind of universal brand because it is and it targets men especially in terms of giving people wings. People having a lot of energy. energy to do a lot of stuff. So if you're playing basketball, if you're playing football, if you're having sex, whatever it is you're doing, if you need energy, you just drink some Red Bull. All right, so that's that too speaks to the whole notion of the intermarket segmentation. All right, so requirements for effective segmentation is that whatever you're doing as a marketer, even today we had a meeting and I and, and the marketing officer, we actually, we, I said to him that we have to approach management with data. You have to have data to back up what you're doing to back up what you're saying and or doing. And this is why many companies sometimes when they're, they're kind of shutting down a department or letting go anybody, they look to the marketing department because sometimes market, the marketing department is not able to justify the spent. They are not able to justify the spend. They're spending, but nobody, and especially if, they, if, they, if senior management is not seeing any results, they're going to have a problem. All right, so measurable, accessible, substantial, differentiate, um, differential, and also actionable. These are just, they call them the smart objectives. So whatever you're doing, if you, whatever you're doing in terms of segmentation, ensure that you're able to measure it. All right, and I go back to the point I made about the fact that with segmentation, you might have a million segments, 
but the job of the marketer, you go after the segments that you can build profitable relationships with. You don't go after every segment. All right, and I gave you the good example of the wholesale that I learned from, from a friend of mine, a good friend of mine who's actually a police officer who said to me, he has a wholesale and I said, and he's trying to get me involved. And he said, Robin, you don't need 20 different customers. You just need five very good paying customers who will spend 100,000 at the end of the week or 200,000 at the end of the week. If you calculate 100 by four, that's 400,000 times four again, you're getting almost over a million dollars collectively. All right. All right, so market targeting. Oh yes, so, so targeting now is, targeting comes after you have done the segmenting. So after you have done the segmenting, I say, okay, these are the segments. Now, as the marketer, you have to determine how am I going to reach them? How am I going to um, tell them about the benefits of purchasing, of making a purchase or using my service versus another brand? All right. So market targeting, evaluating segments, are they profitable? Um, is there opportunity for growth? Does it fit into your corporate objectives? And as I said before, you have to select the most profitable segments. Undifferentiated marketing means that you are going after everybody in the marketplace. That's what it means. You're going after everybody in the marketplace. And usually that is associated with, for example, fast food, um, fast food, <clears throat> Brands. Let me just use the, the term brands. So KFC, they really go after everybody. Um, Popeyes in Jamaica doesn't really go after everybody. They go after middle class and upper class people. Anybody knows where Popeyes is located? No, sir. Them they are crossroad. Um... Oh yes, they move on a crossroad. So it's a semi. It's a it's a kind of. They come into Mandeville, you know. They are downtown. Papa, is this downtown now? Yes, I think so. I think my pastor is downtown. And when this downtown I seeing, goes. I don't remember seeing Papa is downtown. When this, when yes, this sir, downtown. Yes, sir. It's right beside the small tasties. What? So them branching out then. Originally, them they were very much uptown. I used to live off... <clears throat> of Constant Spring Road. And I'm not sure if you know the Popeyes that is at that turn. I know where that is. Yes, and they were, they, were th they were there for years. And they, oh yes, they're in Crossroads now, but I never know that they're downtown now. So I guess they're changing their marketing strategy and, and, and kind of using um, undifferentiated targeting then. Because just... I, know, they, I know that they soon, they soon be here in Mandeville because there's a sign up indicating that they're coming to Mandeville also. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, Mandeville is not a poor place, you know. Mandeville are, are rich people in Mandeville. So I actually have family on both sides living in Mandeville. So, you know, Mandeville are really poor. You have poor sections in Mandeville, but Mandeville is actually not a poor parish. If they were going to St. Thomas now, I, I would be concerned. I hope nobody lives in St. Thomas. I'm not saying anything bad about St. Thomas, but, you know, St. Thomas is one of the poorest parishes in Jamaica. Yes, somebody said, sir. Go ahead. Yes. No, it is. Um, it is. Factually, it is. Go ahead. Okay, sir. I just want to ask a question. As it pertains to even Burger King, mm -hmm. is, um, the breaking um, if up. I go downtown to buy at Burger King, to eat, I think my Wi Fi is unstable. Um, sir, I'm saying, I'm, ask, I'm mm -hmm. just saying that um, the Burger King downtown and Crossroads, mm -hmm. I know. You want to purchase um milkshake they don't have it but if i go to even new kingston or sovereign they have it is that a differentiated marketing strategy yes it is it is okay. it is because they 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 know who to serve what particular um beverage in other words the assumption could be that and this is not factual is that they don't want people to really want milkshake and all them stuff. They want the, the normal so back to it. Really... <laughs> Just go up town. <laughs> Just go up town. Just go up town if you want milkshake. You're not going to get it downtown. Uh, has anybody ever gone to the Burger King downtown and see it look very pop down? Yes, sir. 
very pop down versus the ones that are uptown and they deliberately don't fix the one downtown because if they fix it, the people they're going to march it down the same way. Mm-hmm. So they kind of know the kind of crowd or the, the, the segment yeah. or the, 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 the market, um, the, the consumers that they're dealing with downtown. That's why I don't, I don't really go downtown to buy anything like food. I go to the Burger King that is closer to the waterfront. That one knows a little bit more... Yes, um, it looks it's more, more like secluded. A, a lot of per, only working class persons don't own really. It's a target market for them. Right, for, exactly, exactly. So I'll go to that one. But the other one up in North Paris, eh, eh, I'm not going to that. I don't even like Paris. All right, for the differentiated marketing, no, this is really what a lot of companies do, where you really go after two or more segments of your target audience. All right, so you're not going after everybody. You're going after specific segments in the marketplace. You're not going after everybody. You're going after se- specific segments in the marketplace. So you're not going to follow the, 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 the thing of um, a Burger King or a KFC. You're, going to, you're, going to, you're not going to do that. And this, for example, in speaking about food, if you are, for example, uh, let us say that you are a health conscious um, food brand, then of course you can target, you don't need to go after everybody. You can target um, mothers, because you know mothers are very concerned about not only their health, but the health of their children. You can target um, religious people, especially if they're Adventists. So if you're selling like um, for vegetarians, tar- you can target people who are Adventists because a lot they push a lot about um, vegetarians. You can target another segment could be Rastas are members of the Rastafarian movement, you could target them. I don't know that they'll actually buy unless they're going to employ. Well, not them. only them in, in specific, but Pan, Pan, what do they call them? Pan Caribbean or Pan American. I don't remember their name. But some persons, they are not really Rastas, but they but are they're like Pan Africanists. Pan Africanists. Africa. Yes, yes Pan Africanists. So they, they believe very much into the black movement and all of that. So you can target them. And as I said to you people, marketing is a science. It's when people talk marketing, they think it's just creating a little flyer and you put a little flyer up and you do a little thing. That is not marketing. All right. Um, for niche marketing, no, niche marketing really is where you look at the market. You look at the market. And you look for the little cracks in the marketplace, little cracks, and you go after the cracks. You probably go after one crack or two cracks or three cracks. All right, so where you go after a specialized segment in the marketplace, a very Mm -hmm. specialized segment in the marketplace. And there are so many companies that come out of a problem. So somebody having a problem, and they, they find the solution and they tell the friend and the friend say, really? And that friend tells another friend. And, and before you know it, everybody's asking you to, 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 to really um, assist in that regard. And you form a brand. I want to think, for example, um, the, anybody has ever gone to La Souchon, the supermarket? No, sir, I don't know them place there. Sir, the one up above can near apocalyptic. Yes, me want, I want to assume that these are kind of niche marketing. You ever go in there, especially about up here, white people. I never know so much, much white people there, Jamaica. I went there once and I was so. Un- pure white people. Other people going here? I well, I went there once and they were so, and I'm like, I never knew that so many white Jamaicans. Well, white people are in Jamaica. I felt so uncomfortable. Even my friend was saying, don't feel uncomfortable. I felt so uncomfortable. But they might not be the best example, but you do have a lot of... Um, per, I, I would want to think even private schools, you know, like a... Like a what, the, what the private school name in, in, in Huffer Tree that, that offers CXC again and Cape? Mats Unlimited. It's a very niche approach they have, you know. They go after a very specific market, you know, and they tell you how they position themselves. We will give you the past paper and the answers. We're going to give you the part, the questions, and we're going to give you the answers. Come to us and you are guaranteed a pass, even if that is not the case. That's a very niche approach. It is true, sir. I went there. Yes, that's how they position themselves. We are sir, going to, yes. I never get to hear what you say about the supermarket because the internet went. No, I was to... saying that for La Souchon, 
mm. for me they are kind of they, they they kind of to me operate as a kind of they, their approach to targeting is a very niche approach in terms of targeting very rich and white jamaicans are they not let's not say white jamaicans the jamaicans who are not so dark-skinned yeah them uptown poorly looking one day and Coolly shiny eyes. Yes, the 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 mm -hmm. very very light skin. Where them look with sandals with them pretty toes. Me <laughs> <now> look. <laughs> Nothing is wrong, you know, because if you're in business, you have to you have to select a, a, a um segments and you have to go after them. So if you want to target those persons, target them, and if they are willing to pay the price willing to pay the price and even at Devon House last week Saturday I went there with a colleague from UAE usually when I come back to Jamaica I have different colleagues that I you know we link up and we have a drink and I went to a lounge over Devon House and we were we had two slices of pudding and I had what I call a slush it's just a mixture of I just call it Israeli syrup and um he had the same thing. And when I got the bill, the bill was over $7,000. And I was like, what? So the pudding is, I love pudding. So it's $1,400 per slice. So that is 2,000, almost 800. Sir, so that's go almost. Back there. Hold, 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 hold on, hold on, sir. Hold on, don't move. $1,400 per slice, a piece of pudding? Uh, yes, $1,400 per slice. <laughs> $1,400 for the pudding. So you know they go after very nice. You pay for your pay for your skill. So man, it's a whole of pudding I get you know. No, no. It's so a sir, slice. It's right. a slice. He's very intelligent. Only, the only a extra nice I got. Slice of pudding. The only it's extra I got was a kind of cherry on the top. That's the only extra I got. Sir, $1, don't $1, waste the money like that. It grieves me. <laughs> no, I'm not going there very often. Um, I'm not going there. But when, it, when with my colleagues from here, they kind of, you know, very posh and kind of show off. And I don't want to let um. them think I'm poor. So you have, <laughs> to, you have to go to places that kind of have a little status, you know, speak to your own status as a lecturer. You, you have to be, you know, as a lecturer, you know, even with students, students will say, sir, you're wasting money. But if they ever say, no, I look a pop down car. They say, Lord Jesus, you must work. You must say, my lecture and look on the piece of car where my drive. Students will do that. Look how him look, look how him dress. So I'm always conscious so of that. So they're supposed to top shelf because we all finance can call on people for the money. <laughs> Well, we are not we are not involved in that process. Yeah, so niche marketing now is where a, a brand or a company looks at the marketplace, looks at a particular industry, and looks for cracks, and they try to fill gaps or cracks, and they try to fill the gap by offering something very unique, even in terms of what I would call the motor repairs or the parts industry. You notice that. One of the things that I learned, because at one point I had a parts um, parts shop, I tried my hand at selling um, um, bike parts. But in terms of um, motor vehicle parts, most if you go to some of the, the companies, I realized they don't sell everything. They sell specific things, and it makes better sense for them instead of competing with all the other ones. I'm not going to compete with everybody, but if you want, for for example, the best brick bro they call it breakthrough or something like that, you come to us. And that is actually very, very smart. Very, very smart on their part. All right, so in terms of mar micro-marketing now, it is really where it is an approach to advertising that tends to target a specific group of people in a niche market. It's somewhat similar to, to, to the niche market, but with niche market now, you have several you might have several segments, but for the micro marketing, you only target one segment, only one segment. You don't go after any other segment, but just one segment. All right. Um, and that is, um, and as I said before, just think about it. You segment first. In other words, you divide up the marketplace first, and then you start targeting them. You say, okay, how am I going to go after them? I, am I going to use undifferentiated marketing? Am I, am I going to use differentiated marketing? Am I going to use niche marketing? Am I going to use micro-marketing or micro-targeting, if you want to um, phrase it that way? So evaluating market segments. So structural factors that affect long-run segment attractiveness competitors all right let me show you um i want to show you again in terms of the 
assignment now, the section that deals with what we call competitive analysis. And it's actually not very difficult. What you're really looking at is you're looking at your competitors and what are they doing? Where are they? What are they doing? And if you want, if any of you want to become a marketing officer, let me tell you a big thing that I learned on my own. A big thing that I learned on my own is if you if your competitor uh, puts out a campaign, you buy their product. I know that many companies overseas, what they do, they literally take the company's product apart. This is why sometimes when they buy an iPhone or whatever, if you pull the phone, sometimes the phone doesn't work after because they know that their competitors, that's what they do. They take it apart and put it together and kind of come up with versions of it. Or not. And this is why sometimes you hear companies are being sued by others for quote unquote knockoffs because they're saying, no man, this is, this is a little bit too similar to what I have or how this is or whatever. So in terms of the competitive analysis, what you're looking at is where the, the overall industry, how much does it value? And who are the, who are the, who makes up the marketplace? And who are my competitors and where are they? Who are my competitors? So if it's the tea industry, let us say it is the, is the beverage industry. In Jamaica, give me some um, companies that, 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 that offer beverages in Jamaica. When we talk about With beverage. Cinco. We single. They, they have Aiku, they have water, water. Mm -hmm. They have, they have um, Boom. They, mm -hmm. they, they distribute Boom. A whole, a whole lot of stuff. Right. So here's a yeah. perfect example of how you can do your competitive analysis. You can literally do it this way in a tabular form. So what are you comparing um, in, in the competitive analysis price? Are they more expensive or less expensive than you? Promotion. Where are they and where are you and where are they? So in this case, David sees on, they do online marketing, they do direct marketing, they do bot boutique marketing. The competitor does similar online direct marketing, but if you notice, David C engage more do, does more promotion than, for example, um, Republic of Tea, and they might and David C even if a, your competitor might be doing what you're doing, you might be doing it better. You look at the product, you look at the place. Where are they actually advertising? Right? Are they, for example, a Brit and Marta store? Are they um, people have to literally walk into the shop? Or is it that they have an e-commerce website where persons can go and make um, a purchase? Do they, for example, they have, in the case of COVID now, do they have a delivery system? This is why you see everybody now and them grandmother now have a delivery system. Even one normal restaurant has a delivery system. Another thing that you see competitors are doing now, our companies are doing now, people can actually make a purchase online. I don't have to get up out of my bed because if I want to buy lunch, I can go on my phone, use an app and make a purchase. Companies now have, an, now have apps. So if you're, if you're, for example, if you choose Lasco, if you choose Grace Kennedy, if you choose all these various companies that, that are in the marketplace, Jamaica National or NCB or Scotia, do they have an app? So these are the various things that companies have. So you're looking at what you are doing as a company versus what they are doing. And that is really what the competitive analysis is. And as I said to you, um, as, a, as, a mar as a person in charge of marketing and communication, I supervise marketing and communication. I have been to all of UE's um, online um, sessions about registering for programs. Right now I have that, that sending me another follow-up about the master's program. I've gone to all of UCC's um, programs. I even go on UCC's um, social media page. I watch their videos. I do everything that and find out what they're doing, how they're doing it. And I say, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it better. You have to do that when you're um, heavily invested in marketing and especially if you have to give an account to your senior um, uh, managers. All right, so that is in relation to the competitive analysis. I'm going back to the lecture. Are you guys understanding? We are understanding? I hope I'm not losing you. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so the competitive analysis. Sir, is, yes, go um, ahead. I wanted to ask you something before you mm -hmm. even start. Um, with the niche marketing, mm -hmm. um, does it involve you seeing if you're going to open a business? 
you say you look at the market, right? Mm -hmm. Does it involve you seeing if you should do a business here, whether uptown or in the ghetto? How would yes. it benefit you? Like when persons say find a niche or find your niche, what does it really mean? It's because All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So so one of the things that you're if you say that you're going to start a business, right? First of all, you need to determine if there's a market for, for whatever, you know, whether it be right. a good or a service. You need to determine if there's a market. You need to mm -hmm. find out too what exactly are the, the, the players in the in the market offering. What are they offering? Mm -hmm. So let's just say it's beverage. Let's just say that they're offering, let's just say that all of them sell water. Remember, mm -hmm. originally it was just people just selling water. And what came after water? Let me see if you're thinking. What came after water? Or what did um, the France... water. There you go. Somebody sat down and said, hold on. You have water, but you also know have what? Flavored water. People sit down and look at the market and say, how can I make a difference in the marketplace? Where is there a gap in the marketplace that I can fill? That's what you really do. You see, even some of these taxes, you see some of these taxes that they don't have point of sale machines, some of them would don't realize you know that they would get a lot of customers if they were also if they also had a point of sale machines you know even some of the wholesales some of them are moving towards that but they don't have like a point of sale machine because people don't want to be robbed so they prefer to mm. use a, a, a card because i'm not going mm -hmm. to walk into a supermarket with fifty thousand dollars you must be crazy i'm not doing that <laughs> i am not doing that so if you have a point of sale machine i'll go in make my i'll just give you my thing just load me up you probably call me to a side or whatever. I swipe my card, pay you, and I go about my business. It's what I mean. So those are the kinds of things you do. Sometimes the niche marketing is not just offering a new product or service, but it's adding value. You're just mm -hmm. doing something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Just doing something so, a little sir, bit different. Yes. If, if it is that I say I want to open a closed store in my community, whether it be uptown or downtown, mm -hmm. Would I have to do some investigation or some um what do you call it Ob observe them to marketing see research as, marketing yeah, research. research to see whether or not go, um clothes would be that that persons in the community are interested in buying clothes. You will have to because so one, mm -hmm. you'd have to look at the fact what relationship do you have with the members in the community? That's the first that's the first thing. And that's you and I know mm how -hmm. ghetto ghetto people stay. That's you see, if they don't like mm -hmm. you or they don't like your family, mm -hmm. all when I give them for free, they don't want it. <laughs> so that is one of the first things. I had a friend who I was trying to help to sell um um sell a particular plant. Let me put it that way, because he was really struggling and I was trying to help him. But when I asked him. What is the relationship with you and the rest of the persons mm -hmm. in the community? They never had a good relationship. So I said, who are you mm -hmm. going to sell it to then? Mm -hmm. So you have to look at that. The other thing you have to look at now is, are you able, and we are going to get into um, much later, pricing. Are you mm -hmm. able to offer probably a little bit below the market? So, so they will say, okay, instead, I'm going to go downtown, let me go over Michelle. Are you able to mm -hmm. offer them probably, at the beginning, a lower price for mm -hmm. the good? Another thing too, do they have the purchasing power, power. to make a purchase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah All right, yeah. because if it's a is a if it's a corner, is a if it's a bunch of corner youth and they, they and they and the youth them they, they look at the girls in the community. So them now work and the girl now work. I who are gonna buy the goods? They might trust it from you, yeah, they might have a problem. Amen, sir. Me get it now, me get it, me get it. Yes, you yeah, have some serious problems because they must say them soon get the money and it mind you people are like threatening you and oh yeah, go and like it better than them and yeah, run them down for $200 and re -re, and they don't understand that the $200 is your profit. They just see it as $200, but they don't understand that that one $200 times five equals a thousand dollars. So, so you're very much correct in terms of doing some amount of market research. I have to think about the bad mind people them with the too, because you have some very, very bad minded people, especially in inner city areas. I, I as I tell you, I I grew up I grew up in I don't know, and I can tell you I have some persons. If you open a little shop and suddenly you see people start sprinkle little water, they throw a little lime or little water, and suddenly them start playing songs on Sunday, they play all kind of Jesus song, and this Jesus song of a throw what you know. 
and then slowly you see them start knock up two board now, them are gonna start opening a shop or something of the sort. So as you rightly say, you'd have to do some amount of um, research. Yes, we spoke about this, evaluating market segments, um, structural factors that may affect long run. Um, so competitors, new entrants, substitute, product, substitute products really speak to whether the alternatives that exist in the marketplace. What are the kinds of alternatives that exist in the marketplace that would um, that they can that they, they the customer has the option of purchasing? Because remember, I know marketing is really a game of persuasion. You know that's really what it is. You know a game of persuasion. Why should I take up my hard-earned money that I I either I either worked for or begged or borrowed to buy your good or service over another? You have to give me some very good reasons, especially if you're a little bit pricey. All right. Um, the whole notion, relative power of buyers, and we talk about this, the purchasing power and the power of suppliers. This too can cause a problem for um, your, 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 your customers. How does it cause a problem? If you, for example, have a liquor store or even a bar and I, I, for example, I personally like green ice. I don't drink alcohol. The only thing I drink, I love green ice. So if, for example, let us say that Miss Green has a bar and I usually come there to buy green ice and I normally get my green ice and I'll drink like five or six green ice in one second plus that my friends are there. So in one night, a Friday night, we might buy 20 green ice. We buy the 20 green ice Friday and we're usually, we're used to getting the green ice, you know, over a period of time. And all of a sudden now we hear that the green ice either done or I get one, but my friends don't get any. Then the other week we come, we can't get the green ice. Then we say to you, what's going on? You're saying to us, boy, you know, say the, the DNG truck never come on. You start giving a story. You see, the moment we find an alternative, it's hell for you to get us back to come to your bar. So suppliers, very, very important because you you have to ensure that you are able to satisfy yes, the, the, the request of the, 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 the consumer. Go ahead. So uh, if you have a, um, a decrease in, in, in the amount, in the, um, the, uh, the, qu the quantity supplied, mm -hmm. then it can affect the, the, um, it can affect the, um, the amount of revenue earned. Mm -hmm. Now, not just the revenue, it is going to affect the relationship with your customers. With your customer. mm -hmm. It's going to affect the relationship, with your, especially oh, if they're oh, used oh, to yeah. getting their, you know, let's just say they buy nails or they buy hair or they buy slippers or they buy whatever they buy from you. And you normally oh. sell good quality and then you, know, you have to go force them to go downtown or they go and find a nicer I alternative. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is a, and this is why even... um. Supply chain management is a different area of specialization. That's why we have supply chain managers, because that is their role to ensure that the, that the, um, the inventory always has stocks so that the company or the brand can always have a profitable relationship with their customers. All right, so selecting target market, seg oh yes. Uh, so, and again, oh yes, it's just kind of explaining the different, the terms. So undifferentiated marketing segment, mass marketing. So I had mentioned it. So the firm ignores market segment differences. They don't sell to everybody. They don't sell to everybody. And I think I mentioned that. Differentiated now, firm targets several market segments and designs separate offers for each. All right, so, and I, and I can use the example of Excelsior. So, there are several, so yes, we offer education as a service, right? And we offer degree programs, associate degrees and so forth. We have different segments in the marketplace, but for example, how we target mature students to get into our bachelor's program is not the same way how we target, for example, somebody who is working in the public service and has years of experience, but just needs a bachelor's degree to get the promotion. It's a different kind of um, targeting. It's not the same targeting. How we, how we target, for example, high school students is very different from how we will target somebody who wants to do a master's program. So we might go on a Miss Kitty Live and talk about the op international opportunities that are available to our students for when we are targeting, for example, our young segment, the, the 16 to 18, 
But we're not going to do Miss Kitty Live for students who we're talking when we're the segment we're going after for persons who want to do a master's degree because the two they don't mesh. So that's another thing that you have to be very mindful of when you are targeting the different segments. And this is what differentiated marketing is about. It's, a, it's really targeting the segments in a different way. And, and as it says, of, um, there's a different offer for each segment. Um, concentrated marketing or niche marketing, firm goes after a large share of one or a few segments or niche. All right, and um, as I said before, niche marketing is really, you really find the gap and go after them. And micro marketing firm tailors, tailors products and marketing programs in needs of specific segments includes local and individual marketing. And niche marketing too can come in the sense of operating in the community itself. Give an example. In Denham Town, and I speak about Denham Town, Tivoli, because that's where I grew up and I still go there, you know, with all the excitement that is going on. I'm sure you guys saw the, the video on um, the news with the police and gunmen and gun battle and all kind of stuff. I usually say to people, those are not the persons I'm talking about when I speak about the community. So you have somebody I, I'm friends with, he was very, very smart. Persons in the community who usually want to get um, car parts or bicycle parts or so forth, they usually have to go outside of the community. They have to go downtown or somewhere else. And you know what he did? He converted, he had a, a bicycle place where he, he was just fixing bicycle, bicycles. And what he did, he started, tested the market. He got the bicycle parts first. So when they come, you say, oh, you know, me have tire and me have pedal or me have this and me have that. Look at how they respond and persons were willing to make a purchase. Then he said, okay, let me try my hands at car parts because he's able to also fix cars. So when they come to fix the car and, him say, and he'll say, for example, you know, you want brake shoe or you want this or you want this pad or whatever. He, he would say to them, oh, you know, I actually sell this pad and I actually sell this. He looks at the response of the market. They are willing to make a purchase. And over time, he built up a customer base. And what he did, he, he hasn't changed his model. He's not trying to establish this big old excitement thing. Just micro marketing. All the persons who come through that particular area or live in that area, they are his customers. He has no interest, for example, in going on social media and all of that. He just operates in that specific space and provides, and, and his customers are very, very happy. Very, very, very happy. Of course, you know, you have outsiders that do come to him, but they come to him by way of referral. So, you know, I might tell a Bridget, you know, we have a Bridget who fix car and he, he's very good at what he does and they come into the community. But he has no interest in terms of going on social media because he understands that he's going after the local market, in other words, or the community market. So he's not going outside of the community. And that's a perfect example of micro-marketing. Um, so local individual marketing, and these are just some um, sort of examples. Uh, uh, choosing a targeting strategy. All right, yes, so targeting strategy now. So first of all, what is your understanding of the word strategy? What do you understand strategy to mean? Strategy for me is like a plan. All right, so it's a plan of action or mm -hmm. an action plan. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody else? Guidelines. Guidelines. Yes. Or it is a is an overarching guideline for what we're going to mm -hmm. do, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a strategy about how you're going to actually target the different segments. So there's a factors in choosing a targeting segment. Company resources mean that are you able to, to fund or pay for? Um, because of course, some of these things will actually um, include some sort of budgeting. Um, you might need financial resources. You might need human resources. You might need technological resources. You might need um, specific skill sets that might not be in the company, but you, you might have to contract it out or something like that. Product um, variability, is it that the, the product, for example, when you're looking at the product, is it, for example, how can you sell the actual product? Um, 
how is the product seen in the marketplace? Are you, for example, is the product, how do I put it? Is the product, for example, can we, for example, like add a new flavor, change the color, do basic things to the product that we are planning to sell in the marketplace? How is the product seen by customers? In terms of the product's life cycle, and you know that you know you have the the the, in the the first stage, then you have maturity and all of that, and when it reaches optimum until the product sometime, quote unquote, die. Some products never die; they actually evolve. And what you find with companies, and I think I'd mentioned, I was actually mentioning it in, in my previous class, is that before a product comes to what I call its death, what most companies do is they're always trying to update or upgrade the product changing color adding things and i think i shared something in the in the did i not share something in the whatsapp group i think i shared something in relation to this what was it again people netflix to add video games to service after subscriber growth slump anybody remember i don't know if you guys actually clicked on the thing and read did anybody read anything outside of your busy lives i know you guys are very busy but what Netflix realized at the time, at least they realized no, is that they are not growing subscribers. So during the height and the heyday of the pandemic, people were subscribing like crazy. No, they realized that they're not, um, people are subscribing, but not at the same rate as before. Uh, in order to remain relevant and to maintain their market share, because remember, there are other streaming services such as Hulu, such as, um, give me some of the other ones. You have um, Amazon Prime, you have HBO Max. There are so many other, other ones. They know, so for the moment, Netflix has controls the market or has the largest market share. And when they realize that they are losing, uh, they're not get, gaining enough subscribers, they have to come up with other ways to remain competitive. And one way, as I was sharing, as I shared in the WhatsApp group, is to have a video-based component to it. Who do you think they're targeting with the video games component? Who are they targeting? Kids. So they're targeting kids. Anybody else? Gamers, them. They have some young adults who are gamers. Right, gamers, especially, especially in Asia. <laughs> especially in Asia and where I live in Canada my cousin I, I don't know what's wrong with that young man he plays game forever he has converted his room into a game he has three monitors he has a micro um, he has a kind of recording set so he's playing the game with people all over the world and I said to my auntie I think something is wrong with him and then remember no gaming no is an industry no in, a, in the sense that playing There's game you can win wrong with him. <laughs> no no if you ever see him size, you, would, you wouldn't say that. If you oh. ever see him size, then that's another matter. He's as big as a cow. Lord Jesus. He's very, very huge. And I said to my aunt, he needs to exercise and all of that. <laughs> so, so they, and, and, and it's actually very smart. They're very, very smart to add that to their, um, to their, to their, to their product offering. And even in Jamaica, do you realize now that what, what I call the fun industry. What are some of the examples of the fun industry in Jamaica? I run group here, talk to sir. No, man. You, you, what, what do you see on social media for the fun industry? The, I'm sure you have seen on social media where they have um, the, you, you know, like the games, you, like you can ride the, the ping pong. The, what do I call that thing again? It's the paint gun. The boxer. The, the paint gun where it goes. I don't remember where it goes. It must be sent us wherever. And you have the you can get the the, 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 the the paint gun and you can have sides. So you have one team versus another team. It's kind of a reenactment of a kind of shootout, but it's paint guns. Then you can you can drive the or ride the yeah. bikes or something like that. That's that's part of the fun industry. Where is that? I dirt, is it dirt adventure something? I think it's something mountain. like that. Dirt adventure or something of the sort. Dirt adventure, you ride a bike. Yeah, right. I have a jumper cover as well. 
exactly and that those are part of the oh. fun industry and to me those are niche they, those are niche and they're really eating a little bit away at the in terms of tourism not just the local market you know but even to, even tourists would want to come and enjoy um that kind of thing so so and they of course they have to be constantly be on the ball in terms of what they are doing have to be constantly on the ball in terms of what they're doing all right um the competitors marketing strategies as i, I i've spoken to it um in uh, already in terms of constantly paying attention to what your competitors are doing and you, if you are able to get their annual reports get their annual reports if they are keeping any kind of public forum i would send some ghost ghost attendees to just go and listen to what they're saying even ask questions some people will say it's unethical but as i said marketing is a game and you have to kind of ensure that you're not being outbid all right socially responsible marketing very 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 important and it speaks to the part of the why is my it speaks to part of the coursework. So let me just speak a little bit about social responsible marketing. And I think we had mentioned it before, but just to, on the coursework, it is called this fancy term that is used. Let me just share screen and bring it to your attention. That's not what I'm looking for. <clears throat> um the this part that says global citizenship and equity all right so part of that includes social responsible social responsibility some people call it corporate social responsibility environmentalism and the other one is sustainable marketing right let's look at an example uh where is it is it this all right so let me share screen and go back to it find it in this all right so global citizenship and equity <clears throat> it says sustainable and ethical marketing <clears throat> so companies that up and i'm just reading what is here to kind of give you a sense and I'm, then i'm going to speak to you so companies that operate within the public and private marketplace have an obligation to the individuals they serve no marketplace is insular and is either directly or indirectly to other mar connected to other markets consumers and populations as such companies now have an now have to operate with a renewed sense of responsibility, respecting and responding to the needs of its consumers in an ethical and equitable way. David Stee, as a well-recognized and respected premium tea merchant, has taken legal and ethical steps to ensure that the protection of not only its consumers, but its employees and global partners, such as farmers in the global south. The company's individual products have been certified by Fair Trade USA, this is part of the whole notion of ethical marketing as a brand that participates in fair trade and one that uses organic ingredients. So in your case, you can look at whether or not the, the company is even registered. And if they're using particular trademarks, if the trademarks have been certified. At the first image below, as the first image below demonstrates, as part of the product packaging, fair trade ensures that the company's ethical source ethically source their ingredients. In this instance, ethics are, slash fair trade is about using ingredients that are safe for consumers and producers of these ingredients. And I'm sure anybody has ever had the experience of eating the, eat consuming bully beef and becoming ill? It happened to me, I actually almost ended up in the hospital. Um, I think that was 2018 or 2017. I bought the bully beef. It was a time when they said that the mad cow disease and the mad, the kind of bully beef that was coming, I think it was coming out of Brazil. And the, the warning hadn't been announced in Jamaica. It came right after I had the illness. I knew something was wrong because I ended up at the hospital <clears throat> very, very ill after eating um, the bully beef. So these are the kinds of things that this is speaking to fair trade certification registration and things like that and what this shows now is the kind of this is a fair trade certified so when you look at the package of the actual product what are you seeing on the package itself so if you choose for example whatever company you choose ensure that you look also at their packaging if it is a service go to their website to look to see if they, what are the kinds of certifications they have are they registered 
uh, by the companies of Jamaica, for example, things like that. All right. In terms of the other one, let me look at the other example. Let me see what they, this was actually not the best of the, of the, let me see if they looked at that part, competitive environment. That was just, that's the marketing mix. All right, global citizenship, global citizenship and equity. Let me see what this says. So in recent years, the issue of sustainability and environmentalism has become, has been a, has been a popular topic of discussion due to the vast increases in climate change. It is argued that climate change is being impacted by human behavior and industrial operations conducted by major corporations. There is an overwhelming increase in plastic pollution in the environment, which has proved harmful to the environment. All right, so this is a little bit redundant. Um, so another thing that you want to look at is what kind of, what kind of, how is the, 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 the if it's a food or whatever, <coughs> How is it packaged? Is it packaged using recycle, recy recyclable um, things or ingredients or things like that? Or is it packaged in a way where the plastic can then end up polluting the environment? And local companies are very, very much con conscious of that as well. All right, and I'm just going to jump to something. However, Nestle has demonstrated its commitment to sustainability through significant contributions <clears throat> sorry, in the fight against plastic pollution and things like that. All right. And this is just really kind of giving you a sense of what we, when we talk about global citizenship and equity, and we're talking about environmentalism, sustainable marketing, and um, what's the third one again? Corporate social responsibility. Is it clear, guys? Is that clear? Hello? Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Just give me. Let's take a five-minute break. Let me. My throat is hurting me. It means that I'm talking a little bit too much. Let's take five minutes and then I come back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Exactly five minutes. Let me drink some water and come back.
All right, one thing I wanted to mention of, and, and, and I'm, I'm not fully sharing screen because I want to, for you to be able to see this point when it says, socially responsible marketing serves the interests of the company and consumers. Uh, marketing can draw criticism when, for example, they target vulnerable or disadvantaged consumers or visible minorities, children and teens, and controversy arises if vulnerable segments sorry, are targeted unfairly or with questionable products or tactics. And this was actually a discussion I had some time ago when I was doing, in one of my marketing classes where they say sometimes <clears throat> marketer, marketers go after vulnerable groups and um, sometimes they're left out, they're not even considered as a part um, as, a, as an actual consumer and that becomes um, a problem. So they have to be thinking about all so in other words, in each segment, you also have to think about the fact that some of the consumers are at a disadvantage. <clears throat> All right, so we move. So we, we did segmenting, targeting, now we're going to positioning. And positioning, when you think about positioning, you're thinking about the perception you want the consumer to have of your product. All right, so product positioning, consumer perception of products. What do they think about your, your product? Do they think, for example, <clears throat> that it is a, and I think I'd, we, we had mentioned this, we were having a discussion about, for example, when you think about Yui, what comes to mind? When you think about Nike, what comes to mind? When you think about Island Grill, what comes to mind? There are some brands you associate with uh, that has a positive perception. Sometimes it's called, goodwill in the marketplace, meaning that people have a positive perception of the brand and they, the brand is trusted by the consumer and it has a, a, as a, as a large customer base versus um, a brand that does not have that. So positioning is very important. It's not only the perception of the consumer, but how you want the consumer to perceive the brand. Um, I'm just checking the chat. I see something in the chat. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let me just cancel this. So the so pr product position place the product the place the product occupies in my in the mind of the consumers relative to the competitors. In other words, <clears throat> the perception they have of your product, in comparison to the product the perception they have of the products offered by your competitors. So there's a kind of what they call perceptual maps that are used <clears throat> in marketing. So perceptual maps are often used by firms to determine how they would like to be perceived relative to competitors based upon two variables, usually price and quality. And here's an example of a, um, of a positioning map where we have several brands. We have Cadillac, Infinity, Lexus, Lincoln, Toyota, Land Rover. Um, what can you see if we look at, is this the X or the Y axis? The horizontal um, line, is it the, the X, y axis, y axis. y axis? And this is the X axis. That's right. All right, so the, the Y axis deals with, uh, is speaking to the perception of okay. price by the thousands, right? in relation and the x-axis is speaking to um, what they think about in terms of luxury, um, performance and so forth. All right, so what perception, let us say that we are, let's say that we are Cadillac, Cadillac Escalade. Talk to me about the, 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 the perception in terms of price relative to what the consumers think about Cadillac. Do you understand the question? Hello. They're not fully. Okay. All right. So what's the most expensive car? Um, um, the um, most expensive luxury, um, luxury. 
uh, SUV. Audi. It would be the no no no. Audi is not on the is Audi on the map? Lexus, sir. It would be Lexus. It would be this um, one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Land Rover. Yeah. So this would be the Land Rover. And what do they think about it in terms of performance? They think uh, that the price matches the performance. Oh. Because remember, you know, this is the X axis, right? And the further away we move from here to here, it is a positive perception. Mm -hmm. So people have a very positive perception of the performance of Land Rover in relation to the price. And also too, it, it's probably pointing to the point, the fact that people are also willing to pay more for the Land Rover, the Range Rover, because of the perception, because of the performance perception. So they are willing to pay that amount. Mm. But they are not willing to pay the same amount for Lexus LX5070. Do we see that? So it is the price is very, it's very pricey. It's very pricey, right? Mm -hmm. But the perception is not the same in um, for the Toyota. Do we see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so because it's not above the performance, that's why you're saying. Um, yes. So remember, so you're not only reading here. This is the price. But you're also looking at the, the, the perception now. So persons look at it either as a luxury or uh, they're looking at it in terms of its performance, right? Right here, as we move far away from here, what people are thinking more of is performance. Not that it's a luxury item, but that it actually performs. And it matches here in terms of it being 85, probably $85,000 in terms of the price. People are willing to pay for a vehicle that they have a very um, high um, perception of in terms of performance, which is not the same for Cadillac. It's not the same thing for Cadillac. Alice, let's compare the, the, um, the Lexus in relation to the Land Rover. The, Land, the Lexus is actually very expensive. It's just almost equally expensive. That's a few thousand dollars less. Because if you look here, this comes all the way up. So this is probably almost 90,000, probably. And this is a little bit above, probably 86,000 86, or $87,000. But it does not have um, the kind of perception. And we're going to get into to, to, to more discussion. All right, so differentiation and positioning now. A differentiation and positioning strategy involves identifying competitive advantages and selecting competitive advantages on which to create position and developing a position strategy. Let me give you an example of that. And I actually crafted this for the School of Biz, um, the Office of Graduate Studies. Let me see if I can quickly find. That's one of the things that I sat down and I worked out for them in terms of their positioning. Uh, let me just find it quickly. Da -da -da -da. No, that's not where I want to go. Let me give an example in terms of the competitive advantage. And that's really what, you see the benefits that you put on your, that you see most times, in the commercial, that's really the competitive advantage. Uh, where is it? Presentation, where did I put it? No, it's on the Office of Graduate Studies. Lie. That's not where it is. Office of Graduate Studies. No, is it here? Uh, marketing plan, let me see. All right, let me just quickly go to it. Uh, this, is, this is not the one that we created. Just want to quickly show you that so you understand it. Mm, oh, that's not the one that I want to show. Is it in the creative brief? I think we had changed it. Those are key messages from no, this is not it either. Just give me one sec. I have these things saved all of 2021. What oh, is marketing plan? Is this it? No, this should be it. Open thing, what the? Mm. 
No, that's the only thing that is open. Is this it? All right, here it is, found it. All right, so let me give you an example. No, that's not it, you know, but I'm going to, this is actually segmentation, that's segmentation, but I don't want to show you the segment. These are the messages, all right, here it is. So this is the competitive advantage of the, and, we, and I just use the term added value. So one, we say flexible delivery, and we explain what that means. But, and then we say stackable credentials. What do we mean by stackable credentials? If you're doing your master's program, while you're getting the triple CJ certification, you're also getting international certification. Then we say practical experience. What do we mean by practical experience? There's an opportunity for international internships. So, not, so the international internship is not only for undergraduate students, but it's also for postgraduate students. All right, accelerated format, meaning that if you have, for example, um, been working in the area or you have certain credits that you can go you can finish the program in a shorter period of time all right and that is really what we when we talk about um competitive advantage you're 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 positioning yourself in the marketplace to say here what these are the things that we offer that our competitors don't offer or if they offer it they don't offer it better than us Another thing that I push um, as the person in charge of marketing, especially at the undergraduate level, is the international opportunities that are available to our students. And I'm hoping that you guys are going to make use of that to go and spend a semester overseas or spend an academic year overseas or go on the work and travel program or do, your, do an international internship. And that is something that is unique to Excelsior. I don't hear the other colleges mentioning those kinds of things. So we don't only have the work and travel, but there are various up international opportunities available to our students. And we make, we actually have an office for that, the international office. So there are so many, we make sure that we have that. And that is one of our competitive advantages in the marketplace. We provide our students with um, international opportunities, scholarships, ELAP scholarship. We have several, my admin support has been um, spent, um, she got the ELAP scholarship, spent a semester overseas. We actually have students who have finished their associate degree in Jamaica and now are overseas completing their bachelor's degree in Canada. All right, so that is, yes. So it look like so you have big link at Canada, you know. No money comes so from the school. So you don't think you can't set you up, you know, think you can't set you up in a class so go to Canada, sir. No, but all you need to do is to speak to Mr. Muirhead. You have never been to any of the sessions. He normally has some sessions. Let me put his name in the, and you can email him. Um, by name and number, sir. You have him by name and number. Then we are, then we, you don't need to come to me then, man. He's no, a person. No, that, no, but sir, then are you look like you have the big link. No, so I don't have the big link, you know. Everybody. <laughs> no, I don't have the big link. I just so, so know how to sell the college. Know this overseas thing and thing you, after me never know about it. you didn't know about it? No. No, they All don't right. tell us anything. All right. So <laughs> let me sent in your email. It was sent in your email. Do we that daily at first year student. Student at Eden. No money. No, it's never sent to only first year students. It's always because I am the one that sends most of the emails. I just see the advice, the student advice, and then I can tell you D U A N E. So, daily spelling name. Let me just double check. I don't, uh, we can't benefit from it because we have work. Some people will be sacrificed the work to go and let us say that you can get uh, leave. Public sector workers are entitled to leave. Some of us are not permanent as yet, sir. Okay, D U A N E. All right, so that's his email. He's director for the international office. You can send him an email and he will work his, his miracle. He's going on leave in September, so talk to him before he goes off. So he finishes work officially August 30. All right, so continuing. So developing a positioning strategy. Um, identifying competitive advantages, understand consumer needs better than competitors, then deliver more value. So the more value that we deliver is not just the courses and the programs, but the international opportunities, not just to go on work and travel, but you can do international internship, you can get scholarships. The scholarships are not only available to um, students, but even to staff. The scholarships are not only available, or the international opportunities are not only available to our undergraduate students, but or even our postgraduate students. 
points of differentiation can occur anywhere in the entire customer journey. You can, and differentiation just means that what makes you better than your competitor, all right? Is it, for example, that you can get, um, remember we're talking about the, the master's program about stackable credentials where you can get dual certification. So you can get a local certification as well as an international certification. These are the points that companies are trying to use to, to differentiate themselves from others. And even with Netflix, the mere fact that Netflix is going to now add a gaming component to their streaming service. I don't know that the other ones are, are doing that. And that's a point of differentiation. <clears throat> So in other words, nobody will now need to log out or go elsewhere. They can watch Netflix and chill. Uh, you know, that's the thing now, watch Netflix and chill. So chilling now is not just sex, but also playing games. You are adults, so I can make mention of that. All right, ways to, dif um, ways to differentiate product, features, performance, style, design. And you see that a lot, a lot in terms of the packaging and the labeling, in terms of the branding, in terms of whether or not it's organic or not organic. Services, whether it's expedient, convenient, cautious. <clears throat> do you need, do these persons deliver on time? Do they answer their phones? Do I feel satisfied as a customer? Channels in terms of where I can, I'm able to access the, the service or the good people. Is the staff good? Um, do they treat me well when I'm speaking to them over the phone? Image, inter, distinctive, inter, um, intangible benefits. Image is really what people, um, what they're looking at in terms of the, the brand. They can't really touch certain of these things, but they look at it and say, you know, this is actually a very nice place, or this is actually, I think they know what they're doing, or things like that. <clears throat> Um, so choosing a competitive advantage upon which to, to base positioning, right, and this, you must know this term, unique selling proposition, ESP, and there's another one, uh, they call it ESP, which is emotional selling proposition. So notice this says you're choosing a competitive advantage, so you might have several competitive advantages. But you're choosing one upon which to base your positioning in the marketplace. In other words, what do you want people to perceive about the brand? Or what do you want them to think about the brand? All right. Differentiation and positioning. Differences to promote. Um, <coughs> so differences to promote. Important, distinctive, superior, commit, commute, um, communicable. Communicable. Preemptive, affordable. I'm talking too. Uh, I'm talking too much. My throat. <coughs> um, so remember, no differentiation is you are pointing out what makes you distinct, or different, or superior to your competitor. And positioning, no, is based on how you are. How do you want them to think about this difference in the marketplace? Oh Lord, I'm not getting to that. You don't need to necessarily know that. And the, all right, so we're going to continue um, this because I want you to actually practice this, this, this notion of writing a positioning statement. I actually want you to, to, to practice this. So positioning statement, the format, it usually begins with what is called the infinitive to, the segment and need, and then the brand is a dash, that point of difference. And the example is, this is an example of a positioning statement to busy mobile professionals who need to always be in the loop. So here you see the segment, mobile professionals, the need, always be in the loop. Our brand, BlackBerry brand is the concept, a wireless connectivity solution that gives you point of difference, you an easier, more reliable way to stay connected to data, people, and resources while on the go. As part of your homework, I want for you to identify um, the positioning statements of five local and or regional brands. You can do it as a part of the group that you intend to work with. You can do it that way. All right. Okay. Yes. I'm not in a group. No, you guys are going to determine the group. So you're going to put yourselves in group. Sir, this, this is referring to the coursework. No, it's not referring to the coursework, but I just want for you to come because we're going to wrap up the lecture on Monday. But I want for you to come with examples of positioning statements. The easiest way to do it is I want five. So it's easy for you to just do it with your group members to kind of start developing the synergy in the group. You don't have to do it in a group, but just ensure that you come with at least five examples of positioning statements because I want for you to understand what we mean by positioning statements. 
Is that clear? Sir, in yes, regards to the mix, um, the egg dumb mix, how many questions will we be getting? You're getting, you're getting 20 questions. Multiple choice and... It's multi fully multiple choice. Okay. All right. So, Any other so questions sorry. before we go? The yes. Coursework, the coursework is on Moodle, right? I'm going to, um, by tomorrow it should be there. I, I they sent me the video to upload it because I have to watch a video to know how to upload it. But I'm going to ensure you get it by, by tomorrow you, it should be uploaded. And it's Didn't a good work, right? Yeah, man, it's four to six members. Uh, Sorry, repeat, the, um, the, you were saying something about give five, uh, give five what? Positioning then, statement, examples. Uh -huh. Yes, just find some yeah. local examples or re local and local or regional examples and just tell us their positioning statement. Ensure that you're able to identify the target, seg the target segment, the need, the brand, and the concept, and the point of difference. Target segment, Anna. Here it is, right here. Just take a, you can take a picture of the screen. I'm not seeing your screen, sir. So target segment and need. Target segment and need. The brand. And the brand, the yeah. concept, concept, mm -hmm. and and the, and finally, point of difference. All right. All right. So, any questions or comments before we go? We will wrap up the lecture on Monday. I think we just have a few more, um, but I don't want to rush it because I want for you guys to really understand this part. Oh, we actually only have one. No, it's not one slide. It's like two or three slides. I'll let me log out and log in, but we'll get it. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Have a good night, everybody. It's 8.59 and I'm tired and hungry and I'm sleepy here. and everything. Yeah. May I go send the picture to you? Yeah. Sir, yeah. More sleep later. Yeah, thank you. yeah man, I agree with you. I, I still want to sleep myself. All, All right, right, guys. So enjoy your weekend, everybody. And I, I'll just... Um, put the stuff on the, the coursework on um, Moodle, but I did email it, but at the formal one now from Triple CJ, I'll put it on Moodle. All right. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Stay safe until I see you on Monday. Oh,